Taking a picture of these dusty fields of view is a very popular target today because people are willing to invest the time in the hours necessary to get all the data as well as the time necessary to process the information. It can be a challenge and I'd like to show you some of the steps that I took to try to make that a little bit easier with this particular example. This uh, is an example of the dust clouds in the same direction as Polaris towards the North Celestial Pole. You can see in this image that there is a pretty strong gradient, and it's only strong in the sense it is strong relative to the object, which is very, very faint. If this were a bright object, this gradient wouldn't be all that terrible, but it's pretty strong here by comparison. So taking care of that is honestly one of the most difficult parts of this process. The fact that this is also a northern field has its own challenges that I'll touch on right after this. So here is what the red data looks like. Here's what it looks like in blue light. And you can see, you know, the it's very flat. There's no contrast. The dust just doesn't stand out. It is not yet a compelling image. So what I'd like to do is just step through some of the operations that I performed, the workflow, if you will, for this image. It begins like this. And until we do an unlinked stretch, it doesn't look very good. So in an unlinked stretch, now we can see the gradient. We can see uh, what really needs to be taken care of here. You can see the hints of some interesting structures in the dust. So going forward, one of the first operations I do is just remove the stars. The, it's still in its linear state. And if you're a, a viewer, frequent viewer of my channel, you'll know that this is kind of a, a little mini technique where you remove the stars and just remove, in this case, the bulk gradient. I'm not going to be terribly careful. I just want to get rid of the overall kind of non-uniformity and brightness. And then in a second iteration, there is no rule that says you only can do a gradient correction once, especially in its linear form. You can do it multiple times if necessary. I'll do another instance of, in this case, I'm using DBE. Just a quick comment. You could certainly use other kinds of processing tools, such as gradient correction, but that gives you a much more complicated kind of answer. And uh, the AI type programs, um, AI will give you one answer, but you generally don't have very much control if it doesn't work out. There's also some automated schemes which should try to select, you know, where to click. But those are not going to work when you have a very strong gradient in the image, just like this. So moving forward from here, I apply DBE just to get rid of that bulk glow. And now we have an uncorrected in terms of color image, which means that I'm going to actually put the stars right back. And uh, you just add them back with pixel math. Now I can do a true color calibration. First thing I do is, of course, do image solver if necessary. And then I can use SPCC to do that color calibration, which is what has occurred here. Now I need to restretch the image, and now that the color calibration has taken place, I need to do a linked stretch. And these are the appropriate colors for the stars and the dust. Now while everything is in its linear form, I'm most interested in taking care of the stars. In this case, Blur Exterminator is the next step. Um, it, Blur Exterminator BXT will not do anything for this nebula. It's just too faint. It's too much in the sky or the noise. And Blur Exterminator, for good reason, won't touch it. It's not going to even try to sharpen it. It's really the stars. And I did actually employ a little bit of non-stellar sharpening, but it wasn't because of the dust. It's because there are some scattered around this frame. If, sorry, if we zoom in, there are some background galaxies that maybe can benefit from a little bit of that, but it's not a big deal. And now I'll remove the stars again so that we can have our non-linear image. And it's at this point that I'll do a second iteration of DBE. Let me go ahead and show you what that looked like at this point in the processing here. I did it and you'll look and just see where I clicked. Again, um, until better tools, and I know that PixInsight is trying to make some right now, are available, one of my successes with using DVE is the ability to use my eye and my brain to consistently click in the right kind of places in the sense that I'm just looking for sky values. It doesn't mean that the that part of the image is dark. It just means that those parts of the image have roughly the same attribute in terms of a background sample. That's really what it means. So this area here, this area here, and so on, those all represent the background, whether or not it's bright or not bright. 
it's still representing the background. Now, the confusion that people have is you might think, well, Adam, there's dust. I can see dust. I can see dust. No, that's not how it works. You're going to be choosing a sample on a region where there's useful information. That's not useful. I'm not going to be able to display dust to the nth degree. Sure, it's all dust in this image, but I have to choose a, a lower threshold, a lower level to which I'm going to be you know, ultimately displaying this picture. And it's at that level that I apply all of these samples. Now, after applying DBE without any normalization, um, I'm going to get a, a need to do a new kind of stretch here. And at this point, let me just pause and also say that uh, looking at the data, there's still quite a bit of noise. I haven't done any kind of noise reduction, but I, I just want to point out that the image has a modeling to it. Some objects are modeled by default. I've had some very critical comments about many of my images, and I'll leave the comments to be as they may, but when you are imaging this deeply, it is surprising the amount of modeling, if you will, variation in the background that you get. I haven't touched the background. I haven't done anything. Typically, when you employ something like uh, noise exterminator, the, the way in which I use it is such that I want to just see uh, a noise reduction that's happening at pixel level, you know, one or two pixel kind of scales. It shouldn't be happening on these larger levels. So I will use that, and here it is. I've done, in this case, noise exterminator. And you can see that I am in no way introducing in any of these areas more modeling than what had already existed there in the first place. Now later, you know, once I've done this, it sure enough, I might increase the contrast to the image. And now this is not going to be the, you know, the final result. But if you increase the contrast, they're going to be very dark areas. And the areas that are dark in between the light areas might look like modeling. It's not. That's just a threshold. That's a choice in which you're choosing how much information you're going to display compared to something that you're not. So that, I think you can see how I, you know, eventually worked my way in the direction that I wanted to, to get to that result that I, um, I'm going to show, of course, at the end of the video, if you haven't already seen it. Now, there's one other challenge to this data, due to the fact that it was towards the North Celestial Pole. Any small polar alignment error will cause field rotation. Now, field rotation isn't always a bad thing. Because in this case, you know, the stars are going to be aligned through star alignment and Pix Insight. That's not a problem. But if you have diffraction spikes, as these stars do in the data, it becomes something of an issue. And let me show you what I'm talking about. If I go back in time where we had stars here, and then I can show you what it looks like if we zoom into these stars, you'll see they have either fuzzy or multiple spikes. And that's not, I mean, they look more like windmills. Uh, than they do, you know, nice stars. And that certainly is not desirable. But it doesn't mean that all of the stars, it doesn't mean that they always look like this in this form. This is because I've stacked all of that data together. So let me show you by blinking the images here, what it actually looks like. Why don't we zoom in to one of these stars? If we zoom into this star here, actually, I'm going to choose a different star. Why don't we zoom into the other one? A little bit further over here, a really bright one. Yeah, and this will also go to show another element of the data, which is just how poor it is. This data was taken under conditions where the, the cables that are inside the mount are too close together and they're, they're twisting against one another, causing friction, and that is making the images uh, of the stars well, it's just the images, get a little bit messed up. It's not entirely, it only happens, you know, a couple of times in exposures, but you can see it on all the stars. So let me go ahead and blink. And you'll see, I'm blinking very fast, I'll hope, I'm hoping this is gonna come across in the, uh, in the recording, but you see how terrible the stars are, right? And you can also see the, the diffraction pattern twists. So what did I do? Well, there's a couple of, couple of main points here. Point number one is that, yes, these stars look terrible, especially if you're zoomed in 300%. Now, if you're down here at 100%, it's not, I mean, it's still bad, but it's not as bad as it could be. So people are often very concerned about the shapes of stars, like they're worried about the eccentricity of stars. And I've always made this point that if the eccentricity is a smaller fraction of the total number 
of images, if it's out of round in a smaller fraction, it'll get rejected when you stack the images. That's a form of outlier rejection. And in this particular case, it's very, very prominent throughout my data set where I'm getting, you know, stars of all different directions. Uh, it's almost like a random star streaking and uh, eccentricity going on. Uh, and so, you know, I think that a lot of people would actually throw this data away. They wouldn't even use it. They would just give up. I don't give up. And the reason I don't is because averages are wonderful. When you average data, the combination of averaging plus rejection will lead you not to what you're seeing here, which looks absolutely horrible, but to something that looks like average stars. Now, yes, there's, it's not perfect. You can see some glows around the stars because of the rejection. Rejection isn't going to be perfect, but I would never throw this data away. So that's, and it's actually a hallmark of mine. I think that people have seen my workshops and uh, seen, you know, the way that I do this stuff. I virtually never throw data away, especially if it is an excursion or something that comes out of averaging. So how did I do better with the, with the diffraction spikes? Well, what you do is the following. You actually create a directory, um, another folder of images where the spikes are in the same orientation. Because I have so many frames here, I can do that. So you can see there are some set orientations here. And that's just because, you know, I was imaging at about the same time of night for the same durations across many nights. So you get a characteristic twist after you have gone from one side of the meridian to the other. This happens to be a German equatorial mount. Uh, but I just picked those frames where it was all in the same position. And so I have a folder made of those frames. I come back to here, you can see that I made a folder just called stars where I've collected, um, you know, a goodly number, not that many because stars are bright, of the frames where the spikes were all in the same direction. And in that way, when I co-added those, to, when I stacked those together, I got nearly perfect looking stars as far as the spikes are concerned. In fact, I have one here. Here is one of the images. And you can see that now the, the spikes look fine. They don't look like crazy fanned things. They, they look considerably better than they were before. Well, that's what I wanted to show you briefly about the data set that I worked on. And you can see in the next few seconds what the final result looked like. Please comment down below. Let me know if this kind of information you find helpful um, and informative. And I might continue to do these kind of vignettes on the processing that went into particular images and what I felt was important or critical for making those images a success.